Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Growing Weekend Review. This show was recorded on Monday, May 2nd, 2022. This week, Hovig Manucharyan and I will talk about the following major topics. The peace agenda in motion. We'll discuss the latest developments in the negotiations by Prime Minister Pashinyan to establish his peace agenda. It's not the crime, it's the cover-up. We'll touch on the tragic accident that killed 28-year-old Sona Manatsaganyan in Yerevan as she was struck by Pashinyan's motorcade. Opposition initiates civil disobedience. The opposition escalated the anti-government protests to a civil disobedience movement. After we record this show, we're going to do a Twitter space broadcast live from France Square in Yerevan. And, oh, what a nice prime minister Armenia has! Finally, we'll talk about the 2021 law against insulting Turkishness. Uh, I'm sorry, I meant to say the law against insulting the Prime Minister and other Armenian public officials, which was upheld this week by the Constitutional Court. To talk about these issues, we have with us Tevan Boosian, who is the president of the International Center for Human Development. Mr. Boosian was an MP in the National Assembly between 2012 and 2017 from the Heritage Party. From 1997 to 1999, he served as the nagorno karabakh Public Affairs Office Director in Washington, D.C. Hello and welcome back to our show, Tevan. Hello, hello, Tevan. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for invitation. Great. This week, uh, the opposition to Nikol Pashinyan moved their struggle to the streets, commencing a series of actions that included student walkouts, strikes, as well as other types of civil disobedience. The news is replete with instances of police brutality against the protesters, and we'll cover that later in the show. But for now, maybe let's begin with the issues that could have been the cause for the opposition's uh, revolt. And the first issue on our agenda is the peace agenda, in quotes, of Pashinyan, the Armenia-Azerbaijan peace deal. Uh, As we know, after the trilateral meeting in Moscow in November 2021 by Putin, Pashinyan, and Aliyev, and later in April uh, 2022 by Charles Michel, Pashinyan, and Aliyev, a commitment was made uh, to establish a border demarcation commission and sign a peace agreement. The Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is now planning to host a meeting of the Armenian and Azerbaijani foreign ministers in, in mid-May on the sidelines of the EAEU summit in Dushanbe, Tajikistan. So over the last month, uh, the outlines of the so-called peace agreement are beginning to emerge as Pashinyan's speech in parliament hinted at signing an agreement that recognizes Azerbaijan's territorial integrity and potentially leaving Artsakh within it, or at least that is a major concern by most analysts and political uh, observers that we've had a chance to listen to. The EU, NATO, Turkey, and Azerbaijan have been raising the the pressure on Armenia to accept this solution, with the EU promising to talk to Azerbaijan about undefined accommodations for Armenians of Artsakh to remain in their homeland. The catch is only after the agreement is signed. Tevan, Aliyev has been saying that he wants uh, the maps of 1918 or even before to be used for border demarcation. According to him, Sunik and Yerevan were Azerbaijani lands back then. Foreign Minister Mirzoyan asked why we should limit ourselves with the 20th century maps. Armenians would be okay with using the maps of 5th century, 1st century BC, even 2nd century AD. He mentioned something about Babylonian maps. You know, what are your thoughts about this discussion about maps and, you know, which maps can be used? The disenchanted side of me from the war uh, basically thinks that this is another paper ladle. From one side, you're saying that we should use maps of, you know, the Babylonian period, but at the same time, you're giving away lands that are strategic military positions. Which one is more important and what are you, what's your opinion overall in this negotiation process? I think, first of all, we need to start from the point of view that before getting to negotiations, you need to be able to build up alternatives. I think negotiations is a really a science and which is really very good presented even in American universities, specifically with the logic of seven major elements and where the BATNA is considered to be one of the most important. And until you don't have strong BATNA, you will not be strong at the negotiation table. Yeah. And for our listeners, BATNA means uh, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And I guess what you are you implying would that would be like the, the in this case the BATNA would be military strength. Is that correct? It's it's not only military strength. You're building it up. It's your strategic partnership. It's your national unity. It's your cleverness and uniqueness of negotiator. 
it's everything right. because alternatives see like the most dangerous point with the negotiation specifically which is coming with Pashinyan teams is that they always said that we don't have the uh, alternative besides of peace agreement and go to negotiate if the one side are saying i don't have alternatives it means he would he need to accept anything that the other side is present which we're seeing and this is the problem the logic of this map specifically when ali started let's remind me discussion in munich when fully unprepared nikol pashinyan went and negotiated with Aliyev. You remember, I think, this discussion, so in the Munich. Yes. And he started even, this was a point when uh, Nikol Pashinyan tried to come up with the logic of the Grand the Great, or I think some map on her Coliseum in Rome. And when Aliyev has been at that time laughing at him, like saying that what you are talking. And now it's like Aliyev built up a strong partner, and sitting out with the one who lost to him and definitely presenting whatever he would wish. Right. But this is the point over which says that's why we open up the tone for uh, the discussion. Why is the issue of saying which map is negotiated? If you're taking the case, similar ceasefire agreement has been signed back in 1994. Have you ever seen when Azerbaijan start to beg for the peace agreement. Right. Have you seen that at the time Azerbaijan would be opening up discussions on maps or demarcations or delimitations? For me, the map is the map. Well, Pashinyan supporters would answer that by saying we ran out of luck. Our foreign partners, you know, hung us out to dry and we have build, no other choice. Build, build it up again. Get ready for 26 years and as a building up Batna and become stronger and Take your time. Because for me, it's Republic Armenia borders is whatever is Republic Armenia, which fully, as I'm uh, known, is uh, under the maps uh, in the, the system of cadastre. Right. And any centimeter and millimeter of the land, according to cadastre, is already calculated. Right. Then why we need to say where is our border? The second uh, point is Republic of Artsakh, mm -hmm. which has the same similar electronic cadastre system, and the maps is there. And according to that, the Artsakh Republic National Assembly recently accepted the law on uh, Azerbaijani occupation of Artsakh Republic territories, and they presented fully what, what is the borders of Artsakh Republic. Now, by having this, you need to be ready to defend your any millimeter of homeland, then why you are now getting into the negotiations on revisiting this? Right. Why are we doing this? My issue is here, like whatever you would be going against uh, now trying to come up, there is no any guarantee that even if the next day some point would be marked, Azerbaijan would be respecting it. And by the way, in the speech in the parliament, uh, Nikol Pashinyan has many times repeated that point. That guys, I'm trying to initiate some peaceful negotiation to discuss something. And even if we agreed, it doesn't matter that I can secure that Azerbaijan would respect it. Yeah. Now, if you, no if you know, no guarantees. If you know who is your enemy, then what you starting to negotiate? Why you are then touching the points over which you don't have any guarantees? Tevan, yes. except for the Republic of Artsakh, whose status and existence are the major outstanding issues between Armenia and Azerbaijan, is the existing Soviet border between the two countries really in dispute? Aliyev by himself mentioned it. He said that Zangezuri is Yerevan. <laughs> Sevan is mine. Yerevan is mine. How are he naming it? Can we take those seriously, or are those just basically uh, bravado and negotiation ah, efforts? This is, the, this is the most important point. Living in the society of Western values, good or bad, you're accepting that someone, whenever can talk like this, it can be kind of a, uh, speaking for national uh, or for local community, or it could be hypothetical. When living with such enemies as Azerbaijan, we in Karabakh learned 
that anything like that is not simply Hollywood scenario or proposition, but real dream. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think this is the point over which Armenia today, specifically diplomacy, was not been able to really get to the minds of people outside of Armenia and everyone to present it. That guys, that whenever they speaking like this is not something to take not seriously. Right. Is is it not the same as Turkish policy? Genocide isn't it enough? For the people to understand that when Turks many times talking about their positions, they are not simply uh, changing their mind. When Turkey is penetrating Syria, with whom they have demarcated and delimited uh, borders, uh, do they respect it? When Turkey enters Iraq, is it uh, not the Turkish-Iraqi border delimited and demarcated? And these are very important points to keep in mind. And, and this is the point over which I many times say that, guys, I perfectly understand whenever I'm meeting with someone from the other, put this in brackets, other civilization, but who is the, uh, educated on such values, considering that the other side would not come with the war, let me just remind whatever is going on now in the world. When the Westerners coming to speaking with us, how many times you ask uh, Serbia, or Belgrade about recognition of Kosovo. But see, like even in your countries with your mentalities, you're doing whatever within your interest. And unfortunately, but international relationship is the matrix of interest and not matrix of values. And in this case, Aliyev said many, many things over which he's building up his policy. See like December, 2020, he said that there is no Minsk co-chair groups. Why you even arrived to Baku? I, I haven't been calling you. See, after one and a half year time, do mm-hmm. Aliyev change his mind about this? Was this, uh, at that time, everyone has been saying that, yes, yeah, see, like he just have a victory. Maybe he's playing a game, but within some while he would understand. One and a half year pass or two years pass. Uh, uh, has Aliyev understand anything? with the related to the co-chairs group. Uh, this is the point over which I'm saying that if you would judge based on your own mind without getting into the shoes and understanding who is the uh, Turks and Nazaris in their mentality, you definitely would be coming up with, to Armenia with propositions. You know, we can find out the way over which Azeris would respect Armenians any rights. And this is even trick in the negotiation point, right. which you, today we have. When Armenian, uh, today's ruling government saying that we would be fighting for Armenians' rights. Guys, mm-hmm. it's not about human rights. It's not about right for freedom of speech. It's not about right for having Sunday Armenian schools and something like this. Yeah. The people are speaking about self-determination rights on self-determination this is their fight and not for the rights to uh, the right to statehood basically yes the, it, it's so much thankful uh, we would have a one hour uh, radio program in armenia uh, on, uh, in you know armenia it is so language. cynical because uh, aliyev uh, recently said that uh, minsk group is useless because i by myself implemented the minsk protocol and you know no response from armenian side you know obviously the, one of the chief Point of the Minsk pro- protocols is uh, to avoid uh, military force in solving conflicts. And but, they could have uh, at least accused them <laughs> of the killing of ten thousand people on both sides. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, see, like, this is the real process. Uh, thank you, uh, Hovik, for mentioning it because this is a real process when people saying that, guys, there is no trust over what you agreed and what you would be negotiating. Right. Because right, there is no trust it, in the government. Period. It, yes. That's why whenever even you will be now changing your mind and saying that, you know, maybe you didn't correctly understand me when I said that uh, let us lower the level of uh, status or something like this. Uh, This is a trick to get the time to engage in negotiation because if the negotiation is there, then military use would not be uh, kind of exercised or Azerbaijan would not be aggressive to us. 
and so on. This is a simple trick. When we have been sitting out and negotiating with the three permanent members of UN Security Council as uh, mediators, has Azerbaijan respected non-use of force principle of international relationship? No. Now, guys, right. who told you that if you will now be negotiating, Azerbaijan will not be again violating ceasefire? Yeah. And th this is the point over which you really shows and agreed on five points which Azerbaijan presented. Everyone has been mentioning. We had only heard that Armenians sent them three, some points as an addition, not even the point that if these three will not be included, we will not start. Not as a precondition, right? Uh, yeah. It's not a precondition, but it's just some, can we add some three additional points? Please. Even if Azerbaijan <laughs> would tomorrow say that, guys, no problem, uh, add it. And when negotiation would start it, and they would say that, now, can we turn to the point six? Azerbaijan will say no. How Armenia would be defending with such government? How we even would be discussing this? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's it's, it's mind-boggling. Tevan, I wanted to quickly uh, see if you have any ideas on what Armen Grigorian, the National Security Council Chair of Armenia, and Ikhmet Hajiev are going to be discussing this week. Yeah, uh, today they already met. Oh, okay. EU Special Representative... Uh, already uh, put some tweets with the photos when yeah. Armin Grigorian is uh, greatly smiling. Yeah, and ear to ear. Is, yeah, uh, on that. But the point, uh, as Armin before leaving said by himself, is that this is the point over which they would come to agreement. After that, uh, maybe the summit of Prime Minister and President of our uh, took place uh, again in and if we will continue that this is a EU initiative then it will uh, the old issues which has been mentioned by Michel in his press uh, report after the Brussels meetings I think this is the part that for example yeah. this is commission on demarcation delimitation we're starting these days negotiations and so on and so on and I think it's it would be really a bit problematic because after Brussels meeting, in the meeting in Moscow, everyone understand that Russia is not really happy with the European truck or some right. other trucks. And, and this could even create another problematic situation because I think getting into in such an international situation in the uh, fight between West and Russia on the territory of Armenia is not anything po po positive that could serve to us. We need to really perfectly understand consequences of all that. Stevan, so Turkey has been dangling the carrot of opening the border and establishing diplomatic relations with Armenia, but it clearly seems to be delaying to see Armenia sign a full capitulation to Azerbaijan. The US in its turn has been lobbying Azerbaijan, it seems, I mean, at least that's what sort of the impression that we're getting, that the US is trying to sort of hold Azerbaijan at bay in order not to cause border escalations so that Pashinyan can feel safe enough to sign whatever agreement they're putting in front of him. And meanwhile, what's interesting is Russia's approach seems to be a little bit more nuanced while outwardly supporting the process, yet hinting uh, for Armenia to conduct a more thorough process that achieves a more balanced agreement, including possibly keeping Russian forces in Artsakh indefinitely. At least when we had Benjamin Bawosian last week, that was his impression that it's basically the EU and the West pushing Armenia to sign while Russia is more cautious. And just, uh, I believe, after Pashinya returned from Moscow last week, uh, on April 28th, Maria Zakharova said in a press conference that there are principled disagreements between Armenia and Azerbaijan on the status of Artsakh. So do you agree with this perception that basically the EU and the West are rushing Armenia? Meanwhile, Russia is a little bit more nuanced, even though it's not completely pro-Armenian, but you know, I think it does not want a fully signed agreement with Artsakh in Azerbaijan, because probably that would mean uh, the exit of Russian troops from the region. I agree with the one great point. Uh, why Russia is saying, let's not be in rush, and why 
uh, West is trying to push, coming to the point where the West has its own interest to kick out Russia from this region. And Russia is now busy in Ukraine and saying that wait until I would really be able to see how I would defend my interest in the region. Unfortunately, we are living in the one region when the interest of once mediator group that has been really trying to keep up situation on a peaceful way, now they have an open confrontation. Right. And that open confrontation getting into the points in all issues. That's why uh, West is not rushing be- because of they really wishing peace to Armenia and Azerbaijan. Because if they would, if this would be the real uh, interest, they would do something starting from September 27, 2020, trying to stop the war in a one day time. Right. And the same with Russia. All of these countries are, we need not to be a kids and we need to take it really seriously. I understand that all West and Russia has its own interest and they are now confronting in our region. That's why whatever they would propose is not coming from the point of view, would Armenia benefit out of this or not? Definitely, they would be putting in a cover like this. Mm-hmm. Whatever they would come so that this would can give to you because it could benefit you. Like, let me give you 2.6 billion euro or something like this. Let us open up the trucks road or let us open up the railroad or something like this, but it's definitely would be coming from their own interest. And anything right. is there is to present. And definitely, yes, West would be putting in a, to the rush to say that, see, like there is already agreement signed on the two sides. And what's Russia peacekeepers doing in Artsakh or even what's Russia military base doing in Armenia? And definitely Russia, with all the possibilities to defend their own interests, would be trying to best put delay until they would finish up all their businesses in Ukraine. So the rush, Tevan, right now seems to be because this is a moment of weakness or distraction on the part of Russia so that they don't have as many resources to dedicate to the South Caucasus? The rush is really kind of a moment when West finding that this is the right point to push. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the principal disagreements that Zakharova was referring to? This is a very interesting issue. Thank you for this question. Take it also in the context of our first answer about uh, should we take seriously Aliyev positions or not. Aliyev already once said that until I am alive, there never would be any status mm-hmm. for Artsakh. There is no such territory on the territory of Azerbaijan, not even in a cultural condition. Not even in any. That's all. Forget it. Okay. Now, uh, for being able to get anything, or we need to eliminate Aliyev, or we need to wait until uh, Aliyev will pass away by his natural life. I don't know. But in reality, for Aliyev, it's zero. Now, anything different than zero is a drastic change in the relationship of uh, status. Even cultural status is a different position. Even economic status, uh, some economic conditions, or like the saying free zone. For uh, Azerbaijan, it's not possible. So that's why it's, it's for Aliyev's position. Yes, it's not possible. And that's why you can always consider that anything different from the zero is a really a problem for bringing sides together. Now, definitely, at least this government talking about rights of Armenian, uh, historical heritage, uh, cultural heritage, blah, 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 which is meaning like uh, something, uh, some kind of a status of autonomy and which is not accepted by Azerbaijan. That's why it's in Zaharov's opinion, it's, it's a fully drastic uh, difference. And this is another fight. And, and so Tevan, like, just a quick interjection, that status of autonomy within Azerbaijan is also not accepted by Artsakh itself, correct? Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. That let's, yeah. let's me finish that I'm coming to this point. Mm-hmm. And like, uh, this is the point over which sides are different. Now, Karabakh position even saying that nothing besides of independence, we never would be there. And this is also heard by every side. And if you consider the statement of Pashinyan that 
See, like I have been always communicating with Artsakh leadership. I have been always telling them what has been happening and so on. Then I'm taking, okay, let me trust and consider that definitely Pashinyan has been always communicating with president of Artsakh on all the processes that are mini agreed. Now, after such communication process, just about three or four weeks ago, or three weeks uh, closer, Artsakh Republic National Assembly accepted a statement call to the whole Armenians in the world. That's right. To diaspora and to Armenians. I don't know what you have communicated, but if after your communication, Artsakh people didn't find any other way to consider that, oh, thank you, Armenian government, because they'll be taking care of us and make the call to the all Armenians for the defense, support, and help. It's meaning that you communicated something bad. Right. And then uh, you, you're coming to the point that even that wouldn't be possible or acceptable by these people. Yeah. And that's why you're getting into the situation where we have uh, really drastic positions from the point of view of mediator such Russia, who has interest to delay the process. And then they're using it. Now I am looking to the point over which the Western diplomats are sometimes saying that until the status issue is not resolved, Karabakh issue is not resolved. But when you're asking them, guys, what is the status in your opinion? They never presenting it. And which meaning right. maybe for the West is a cultural autonomy is a something good. And this is the West uh, that is international community that has been pushing Pashinyan that uh, you need to lower your bar on the status issues. I remember that the same kind of an international community about four years ago, according to Aliyev, has been pushing him to recognize Artsakh Republic. Yes. And now they're pushing the uh, loser side. And this is another point over which, if we're talking about negotiation, for the sake of nation, for the sake of statehoodness, for the sake of all Armenian dreams and something national like this, you change it negotiator. This is point of building alternative. It's another Batna issue that you're not getting to the table the one who signed agreement on loss yeah. or accepted by Azerbaijan as a capitulator. Because just two days ago, Aliyev on his speech said that the most successful or happy day in my life that I have ever had is the day of signing capitulation. Now, if I'm really feeling responsibility for my nation and state, I perfectly understanding that this is words about me. How I'm not by my own self understanding and peacefully resigning to not allow enemy having another happy day. Tevan, I have a... A quick question, because just yesterday, Aliyev made another, from one perspective, it's comical, but another perspective, it's actually very horrifying statement, where he said that Armenians should not think about strengthening their army. And even like baffled me, I had to read it tw- uh, m- many times. Uh, he said Armenia should not even think about raising its population to 5 million. To me, this guy feels basically he can like at will apply abortion on Armenians. I, I don't know what like I don't know how to interpret that statement. I mean, that's that. Yeah, these are mind boggling why, why statements. Why isn't the Armenian say, government say, saying say, anything about say, this? Say, say it's, it's again. In two days. You, you you just simply trying because you link and grew up in the much civil value system uh, issues or on the democratic side trying to say about abortion. It's not abortion. It's genocide. Yes. Sorry, he's saying that your nation should be eliminated from the world. It's the genocide. This is a genocidal policy that is coming. But whenever you, you're telling, is it only Armenians who have read Aliyev's death statement? Where is the international community position? Yeah. Where is the defenders of the values of democracy? Community of democracy. Yeah. Where there are voices? Why, why we don't hear that? What you're talking? What does it mean that you uh, never, after this, need to think about growing 
not in population only, but even as a country or something that is growth is a growth. Growth not mean only f- physically in the border, but even in the population. But see, like it's not the first time when Aliyev saying similar statements by different words. And because the right. previous uh, statements never been taken seriously, we're now uh, starting to feel this point over which Aliyev perfectly understanding that if the Armenians will live in this land sooner or later, that ceasefire could uh, again not satisfy the status quo and something could change. He's in a rush to eliminate you, as he said that. He, yeah. considering that they would come back to Zangezur, Sevan, and Erevan. That's why he's asking that you need to forget about this and you just need to not grow up and uh, be eliminated from this point. It's the, the same point over which we many times have been saying about their genocidal policy and which is coming as like continuation of the same Turkish policy starting back in 1915. At that time, Turks done it on the western side. Now Aliyev trying to do the same on the eastern side. Tevan, this past week, Pashinyan also met with Aray Karutunian, the president of Artsakh Republic, to explain that his peace agenda is actually good for the people of Artsakh. This was probably necessitated by the strong rebuke Pashinyan's parliamentary speech received early in April from the legislature of Artsakh. We just talked about that. Now, after the meeting, Harutunian stated that he supported the peace agenda, but that Artsakh would not deviate from the path of self-determination. Can you explain this to us? Say, like, if there is a precondition that Artsakh is not going to accept anything like this, it means that peace agenda would not be existing, because Azerbaijan said that there is no status for peace agenda. There is no Karabakh. Now I would like to understand like how in this system we, we need to move ahead. But later on, I'm reading that immediately after that meeting, Armenian government increased 20 billion drops for another construction worse in Earth. Yeah. Maybe this is a, it's turning me to the already political points. Right. Over which today's government is trying to say that, guys, I will give a bit more money. Can you accept? Hmm. It's it's much more crap because see, like on the immediately after that meeting, we also see uh, or read Artar Beglarian's statement that in all cases Artsakh would not accept anything less than self determination, mm-hmm. and we never would be living there. It's much more has been the game for the internal forces because uh, already opposition in Armenia start to raise its voice and there was a, already a process initiate to speak about this. I think that meeting has been mainly not for the international diplomatic points, but uh, trying to... More of a domestic low, thing. Uh, yes, for domestic sides and, and this is issues. Because in reality, if it had been international point of uh, any view, then we would not maybe see many meetings or many things uh, going to be in a rush. So does this uh, mean that Artsakh politics are splitting from Pashinyan's politics a little bit. As we were talking with Benjamin Boosian last week, he was saying that essentially Armenia has almost nothing to do with Artsakh security. So at this point, it's a Russian affair. And so maybe uh, Artsakh is turning to Russia at this point. See, first of all, Armenia has a, a, some legal obligations towards Artsakh in reality. Uh, it's meaning that the Armenian government would not be fulfilling Armenian legal obligations. Second, uh, security is not simply of uh, having a weapon, but it's also economy, it's also psychological point of view, it's also national, many other issues, you know, right. which Armenia have to have. And as of today, uh, in reality, security in Artsakh provided by the Russian peacekeepers and the local uh, Army of Defense of Arts Republic. Now, with all that issues, but Armenian nation should take responsibility. And Armenian state should have a responsibility on the security because security, as I said, that is not just simply issue of bullets or uh, bullet jackets or kind of a guns. Uh, security is a much wider concept. How about information security? How about psychological security? How about the food security? How about the demography? 
Isn't demography an issue of the security? That's why yeah. we need to perfectly understand that if we would be simplifying many issues, uh, then yes. But Armenia could say that I'm not now strong on the security side, but who is the ally of Russian Federation who is providing peacekeeping? Our Republic of Armenia or Artsakh Republic? Then if our Republic of Armenia is a, also a lie, strategic ally of Russian Federation, do they have a uh, bilateral relationship that could support and keep stronger Russian uh, service on provision of peace in Artsakh Republic? Let it do even through that service, provision of security point. Yeah. Of view. It's, it's always an issue of that, are we having this national goal to try to do something? Or we just seeing, thinking how to clean up our hands and say so that, guys, uh, don't touch me. I am busy with my own stomach. Tevan, in conjunction with uh, negotiating with Aliyev, the Pashinyan administration seems to be inching closer to the warming of relations with Turkey. Today, Turkey's foreign minister, Çavuş Oğlu, said that an agreement with Armenia has been reached on the process for demarcation of the Armenia-Turkish border without specifying any details. Uh, this was immediately, I believe, today denied by the Armenian foreign ministry. But given the track record, you know, none of these denials in the past, at least, has had any truth to it. Whatever Çavuş Oğlu has announced so far seems to be, have been yeah, true. Yeah, in, in it, uh, two, two weeks' times, it's proof. So while, while Armenia has not openly challenged the mutual border, the, the, my question basically is, Armenia has not openly challenged the mutual border with Turkey. And there is a USSR-Turkey officially recognized border, obviously. And, and Turkey has actually in the past called for Armenia to independently recognize, based on the Treaty of Kars, as a precondition to establishing diplomatic relations. If we're to believe the words of Çavuş Oğlu, does this mean that Armenia has accepted yet another precondition while loudly proclaiming that there are no preconditions. Oligjan, oh, Armenia, this ruling government has been saying no precondition, no precondition, no precondition, but after fulfilling all preconditions. <laughs> right. Uh, so like they fulfill all preconditions saying now no precondition, but there is a one big precondition still exists. And a few weeks ago, even Armenia foreign ministry once again, kind of a nicely through media said that it's not always nice when on the weekly base, one Turkish foreign uh, responsible person saying that a Turkey would be always coordinating and do everything in accordance or acceptance or agreement from Azerbaijani side, mm -hmm. which simply means that it's not Armenia who is negotiating with Turkey, it's Armenia who is negotiating with Azerbaijan. Because if Azerbaijan will not give a green light, Turkey will not accept anything. Now, I don't know what else Azerbaijan put in front of these people to accept. But as you correctly mentioned, starting from 1991, Turkey has been always using this point that let's recognize our border, let's discuss the border issues because they have been afraid that the Kars agreement would pass 100 years, then who knows what would happen, and so on. There were so, so many discussions. At least for me, it's really unclear because Armenian-Turkish border is one of the may maybe most equipped, properly demarcated, delimited, I don't know, with everything which is possible, borders. To even touch that issue, because from the political side, Armenia has become independent based on its declaration of independence. Are we forgetting about everything? What has been in the roots of this independence? Are we forgetting and fully uh, throwing away Karabakh movement, our national liberational movements, our uh, declaration of independence, our constitutions, our referendum on independence, and so on. It seems like Turkey and Azerbaijan found the perfect match for them as a lost Pardon. person there to both of them, and just now playing a ping pong sometimes, even not the football, but ping pong, whatever they wish, they, they're just throwing to you. And saying that you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. 
Right. Because they've been saying that we need to open up the border. It's a technical issue of five minutes work. Why it's not done? We need to establish diplomatic relationship. Is there again uh, another point of view that ambassadors in UN can sit down and sign that, that document? Yeah. Now, are they serious? Because Turkey has been telling to international community that this is about some occupation uh, of Karabakh forces of Azerbaijani land. Now Azerbaijan is saying that I liberated my land. That, that's why I'm saying that if, if you're talking after fulfilling all preconditions, they're still playing a ping pong. Next day, they would say that what kind of a course? There was an Alexandropol uh, agreement. There was, I don't know, Moscow agreement. There was Batumi, some issues. And definitely would come to the point of view of uh, Ataturk's proposition that I think Yerevan, Aparan, and Echmeadzin is it enough for Armenia? They can stay like that small Singapore type of state, which would be like yeah, Yerevan city type of state, city state. It's enough for you. But a- again, as I said, that Turkish and Azerbaijani dreams or their image about Turan or something like this, I don't know if it would, would be fulfilled because there are many other countries engaged. But at least their all policies on eliminating Republic of Armenia, eliminating of Armenians from the region, they, they're definitely trying to bring into the uh, reality. And this is thing where Turkish and West interests are coinciding on being doing everything in a rush, because Turkey is perfectly understanding. They are the major provider of Western policy in the region. Right. They are their major partners, and they perfectly understand it, that now their interest is coinciding. Why not go ahead? If previously U.S. has been trying to do something on like Turkish-Armenian relationship, on genocide recognition or protocols, to the point of view to get Armenia closer to itself to uh, really build up with or uh, try to work with Armenia on weakening the Russian interest, uh, weakening the Russian yeah. positions in the region. Now they perfectly understand that they can do it through Turkey. Why uh, we need to care about Armenia? Okay, uh, Tevan, we need to move to the next topic. And yeah. we probably will not do justice to discuss this, but we wanted to mention that last week there was a tragic incident where Pashinyan's motorcade uh, ran over a pregnant woman both uh, the baby and uh, the lady died. It's a terrible and tragic accident. And it's always tragic when wonderful people, we lose them. Uh, we grieve for the loss of this bright young lady with her family. Um, you know, there has been a lot of indignation and resentment in the opposition in the way that Pashinyan's motorcade behaves and the way how this incident was handled. Uh, there were apparently other reports how dangerous situations uh, that Pashinyan's motorcade has uh, landed in in the past. Do you believe that this is just a sort of internal politics or is the opposition right to demand some kind of accountability from the Pashinyan government and question this, even though the wounds of this death are still very fresh? See, like, I think uh, everything is coincided so quickly with one with uh, each other that there is so, such a fair, famous proverb, yes, like anything which is happening in the world, they are related to each other. I think yeah. the most important issue is the following, that the behavior of the state about caring of the common people and not only thinking about their power and chairs become very sensitive. And now anything which is happening, it would be connected to this time. And because Pashinyan by himself has been the one who has been always trying to put in a connection during his opposition time with the ruling uh, regimes of previous years, uh, I think they're just uh, paying back to him. It's a payoff, uh, let me say that, on the way to say that or boomerang, to the point of that this was your behavior, now see how you feel it. But in reality, I think the problem is coming that Pashinyan by himself has been promising about totally different state behavior or officials' behavior. And definitely uh, now everyone would be using. Guys, you not fulfill any of your 
promises, obligations, or everything. And yeah. at the end, there is always something as a sign. And I think this was a sign issue. So no matter that, in a way, you who has been used to drive bicycle to the world, walking on the streets or do something like you now going to one meeting in the empty streets with such a speed that you or uh, cortege hit pregnant women who has been passing a road by the proper place yeah and on the crosswalk <clears throat> on the crosswalk and, and, the, and there are the, the, the videos, according to some videos, obviously we have to let the investigation happen. But according to the videos, the light uh, on Pashinian's side was red even. Or uh, may he have has been, been red. saying that he is officially can drive as a risk. But remember how many times he has been saying that previous leaders, how they driving, it's all about their driver lines. Instead of one car, uh, they using 10 to 12 special way to go yeah. and blah, blah, blah. This was, has been one of the points over which is permanent critics to the government uh, when he has been in opposition. And now mm -hmm. he's doing even worse than that. And definitely it has been uh, really noticed. And people get tired already of all the issues that guys, even su such cases. Has been. And the second, uh, you know, like uh, after war, after pandemia, after having so many losses, which is never been in the case if, for example, we live in a normal uh, kind of a life situation, we're getting another loss and then this turning into the really emotional for everyone. Empathy issues or something yeah. like this. It has been really in the society that imagine none of them has stopped. Okay, if even your first car, according to protocol, should not stop, but you, everyone knows that you have a special connection, a communication yeah. systems. Why yeah. the first car didn't ask the last car when there is no any danger anymore to Pashinyan? Stop and see what's happened with that lady. Yeah, yeah. So, Sona like, Sakanyan is the name of the wonderful person that we lost. Uh, she was also a very patriotic person. Apparently, she was uh, the coordinator of Support Our Heroes, which was operating in Artsakh and doing IT projects. It's tragic from whatever you, way you look at it. So our condolences to the uh, family and to uh, anyone, everyone who knew uh, Sona. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I think in reality, uh, I don't know how to even say it, but it has been really unhuman uh, behavior. Specifically that when it's happened, if even some kind of a people from the, uh, his team would start to say that it was not correct or something, they start to say, you know, according to protocols, he should, it, it wasn't been him who has been driving. They start to find an argument yeah. that like you, you're trying to politicize these issues and it's even make much more angry peoples. That guy's instead of just accepting that you done something bad. Yeah, his deputy chief of staff started making excuses. And... Yeah, or uh, at least you need to go with the resignation circles mm -hmm. for the people to say that, like the head of that road police should resign, uh, someone else should resign. This, but they kind of said that they start in the investigation, and in a one day time they free the guy. The driver. Like, uh, the yeah. driver without leaving the country when for example for the people who didn't kill anyone or done anything they for months is keeping them in a jail not allowing to go out all that uh, all this kind of a behavior has been uh, really putting a negative uh, yeah thing. accidents happen but uh, it's the deep lack of empathy on the part of the it, government it's, it's, that it's has outraged how everyone. you're reacting to it how, how your behavior are, are, are after that. And people could accept and say that, okay, it could happen. Guy has properly behavior. But after that, if something went like this, they immediately uh, started not accepting any kind of issues. And no sorry, no statement, no, nothing from their side. Everything is has been just reaction after something has been told to them. And uh, it's like you having a fight uh, after you lost the fight. I would like to move us to the opposition protests. These protests seem to be gathering steam 
now going on to their seventh or eighth day of street demonstrations demanding the resignation of the government. Needless to say, the behavior of the government has further incensed and fired up the opposition groups. Armenian police report that there are more than 200 people who have been detained today. This is Monday, May 2nd. I know that both of you have attended these sporadically at times. What is your take on this event? Hovi, can you talk a little bit about it? Well, um, my take is that there are a lot of people from all walks of life, from all political circles, and definitely, you know, you're not even near what the supporters of Nico like to say that this protest is organized by the main evil bad guys, Kochayan and Sarkisyan. But I, I've seen people from all li- uh, walks of life who are simply sort of, you know, want Pashinyan to go. Uh, and that's what I'm seeing. It just I mean, that there were some previous protests the previous week as a, as a prelude. And uh, Sunday was a very large rally that started from when, when four different groups congregated. They were walking from different parts of Armenia. Uh, and today, in earnest, started the civil disobedience uh, movements. For, for, for about four hours, the city was paralyzed. And basically, I think they're repeating the tactics of Pashinyan. And yeah, I mean, I think people, I think, realize that it's either this method or something that is maybe unconstitutional. I mean, you know, they, they, you know there is a sign of desperation in a lot of the people that I talk to who really sort of don't want Pashinyan as a symbol of capitulation as a symbol of the death and humiliation that we have witnessed and continue to witness every day. I personally am speaking for myself, but yes, many people since uh, November 2020 live in this complete state of humiliation and they want to get out of it. And they see Pashinyan's resignation as uh, the, the way, the only way that they can start to heal from this process. Tevan, um, I wanted your, your impressions as well. I think in reality, even it started by Vanetian, kind of with the point that he went to the street and would stay there. But I think it's little by little turned into the really national part. Now the agenda mainly is not about uh, only opposition because it's a parliamentary opposition. There are some out of parliament oppositional groups. There are a lot of personal uh, people, uh, artists and so on, joining them, various groups, businesses, uh, and uh, it's it's really turning into the national. And I think one issue that united and allowed that so many different type of people come up to one point is the issue of the Artsakh and Armenia. And definitely for all of them from the different point of view, it's one thing that the first step that the ruling government should uh, leave and go, and Pashinyan should leave, and this is the start to unifying position. And from day to day, it's really feel that uh, it's growing. I think if tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, this protest would be continue and it would scale up, that definitely they can reach something. From another side, we need to say that consequences of success of people on the streets it would be new government or would be new people, new team to dealing with that. Consequences of their loss would be repression, totalitarianism, because all these people will not be after that simply able to walk on the uh, to their workplace and go on. I think the sites are cross up some red lines. Right which, uh, again, would be weakening up Armenia. Tevan, I wanted to ask you a question. Many in the opposition see the events of February uh, 2021 as a missed opportunity, and they criticized the tactics of the uh, opposition at the time, which uh, eventually included giving up street protests and going for elections. Do you believe that the opposition is doing the right thing now, or just this prote- protest movement? Are they doing the right thing? And what comments would you have on that? What you know, t- what you know, correct things did you did you notice, and what do you think they should improve on? I think the really weakness of our nation has been not the February but November of 2020. Of 2020, yeah, right. If first of all, by himself, Pashinya would understand and resign even after one week and getting everyone together so that guys, yeah, I perfectly understand that uh, I've done a bad stuff and I need to go and let's do something. This would be the best solution. 
Yeah. And after that, you can come up that each month has been the lost opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. December was lost opportunity. January was lost opportunity. February was lost opportunity. Every day was lost opportunity until, uh, unfortunately, at that time, another two political parties in the parliament, I think, played the game. I don't know even if they had been hoping or not, but see, like, sometimes there's a very unique situation. Both of them was agreed on this extraordinary election of process last to the election. Neither of them has been now in the parliament. And to, I think after that, there have been, again, so many lost opportunity issues and nothing has been improved. No national unity come and something like this. That's why for me, is not, it's, it's not the political process, but national process. We're now facing a national challenge. And that's why if you're asking me, are they doing correct things? I would say that at least one positive element already there. On its official statements, Pashinyan stepped back from the lowering the bar to the point that we would always discuss issues with Artsakh and if Artsakh would not agree, we will not go with this. And Artsakh already said that what they accept. Like if Artsakh said that I will not accept anything less than self-determination and independence, then if you're saying that whatever we will discuss everything with Artsakh, if they would not agree, will not accept, then the guys already told what they would accept. Then you can just simply say the same. So like uh, something already uh, happening. And I think if they continue the fight, they would uh, really do positive points. Mm -hmm. Tevan, part of the frustration on the part of people with the opposition has been their inability to bring about change for the past year and a half. And in my conversations with a number of analysts and people in general, the mention has been that most people are asking what would be next after regime change? Who would come after Pashinyan? And okay, a lot of people have concerns that we would go back to the so-called formers, the Nahkins. Do you think that this is really an issue at this uh, point? Uh, guys, I think it's already becoming a very uh, manipulative, even getting tired. What's mean Nahkins? Is uh, Khachatuk Sukhyasan uh, not a uh, former? About 22 members of the Pashinyan parties or some of his ministers are not coming from this former of formers. But if you're taking the guys who are speaking on the street today, not on the age side, but yeah. on the political life kind of a uh, experience, they're mm -hmm. all much younger than Pashinyan by himself. And seems like on that regard, they are much newer than uh, ruling government. Uh, that's why I would say that it's a manipulative point over which Nakhkin, not Nakhkin, we discussing on these issues. But the logic is following. For me, in November 2020, 20, I propose that go to election is the wrong uh, policy. We need to come up with the uh, anti-crisis uh, uh, management team. Yeah, national unity government. See, like even something big different than that, because when you're saying national unity government, people are understanding from political parties. I was say, yeah. saying that, guys, we need a technical anti-crisis managers out of the 10 million Armenians in the world. Because we are in such a crisis, I'm not caring if the constitutional that point of four years permanent citizenship in Armenia. If I know someone in America who is the greatest uh, person uh, to manage, for example, a crisis in social system, let appoint him. If there is a, someone who is do the great economic anti-crisis from Melbourne, let get that guy. If we have someone who is the perfect uh, anti-crisis manager in health system from Yerevan, let's appoint a team. Ask them a some while until they would overcome the whole crises and let's political parties during that one year or one and a half year time getting ready for the election. And after that, we would do election. Now, I think the same approach could be exercised now, which is already a few times presented by the various groups on the street, that this could be a nice, good approach on the national unity government. They're saying some names which is not related, 
with their former part. But whenever you come in with the name immediately, it's turning into the point that everyone is trying to find him and start to blame all these issues and start to blame a new kind of a, this uh, manipulative game over which the ruling government is playing on this regard. Yes, even if tomorrow Pashinyan resigning, let this parliament uh, would come up with this point. Why not let's by himself, by Pashinyan, come and say that, okay, guys, I understand that this was a wrong uh, policy. Let us build up this national unity. First time on national unity issues, I proposed still in June 2018, when I said that it's really time to develop political consensus building room in Armenia, when the whole political part doesn't matter in parliament or outside of the parliament, could come and peel uh, what is our acceptance on many, many issues on the looking to the future and something like this. Uh, we miss so many opportunities that it's really difficult to stay. Now, definitely, yes, uh, we need to perfectly understand that in this crisis situation, where is the worst is our psychological crisis which is happening. Uh, as Aliyev said, that Armenian nation should always live with the stamp of losers on their head. We're trying to kind of say that Okay, let's accept it, but just leave it. And which is not accepted for me. That's why I'm not afraid of Nakhkin, Nerka, or something like this. Guys, let's come up with the person who would bring logic of national unity again. And whenever people asking me, and who is your candidate, I'm asking you. You <laughs> ask me, I'm proposing to you. He says, I'm not, for example, enough educated. He says, great then you perfectly understand it. Do you have some minus? What you would do in that chair if you know that you have some minuses? You would try to build up the situation where your minuses would be covered. Let's get someone there on that regard. If not, guys, we would be losing in any way. Let's open up the window of door of the chance, of new chance, because with the loser government, we would be having a new losses. We need to work on a government that is based on meritocracy. But to answer that question in another way, a lot of Nikol supporters say that, oh, we can't let the formers come back. Well, I believe it was on Saturday, Arman Tatoyan, uh, in the midst of all the protesting, had his own sort of meeting with his supporters, mm -hmm. where he talked about all the reasons why he thinks Armenia is going in the wrong direction. And it sounded a lot like a campaign rally, to be honest. So I'm wondering what all those people who are saying, you know, oh, well, anyone but Serge and Kocharyan, Kocharyan, Serge and Kocharyan want to come back. What if Arman Tatoyan threw his hat in the ring? Would they be happy? Something tells me they wouldn't. But I'm really hoping that these people, uh, whether it's this negative stereotypes that they've had, they, they, they have to, I think we're at a point where we cannot uh, let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And we have to allow for our, our nation to heal from this process or well, or else we're going to have this cancer metastasized. See, like, I would like to add just only one point of view. So like, for if I'm taking to the point of view whom Aliyev is much more afraid to come and whom he's saying that you need to forget about building army, becoming 5 million or taking revenge. Yeah. Now, if I'm saying that if my enemy is afraid of something, then why I need to come up with something to please him. Teban, your problem, point. your problem yeah, is you have too many, is... too many objective uh, points. <laughs> you know, you have too, yeah. too many ways to measure things objectively. I think we just have uh, to you know, go on. See, see, like, this is one point. From another side, already one of the uh, formers said that he never would come. Right. A few months ago at the Republicans' Party Symposium, Sarsak Sam said that I'm not going to come anyway, forget about this and that. Now, if this issue with the only Kocharyan, it's another point of view, but if you're seeing that even sometimes they uh, have the point of, well, should we go with the younger or with the older one? Arman Tatoyan is another candidate. Who said that there is no another candidate by himself? Kocharan once said that why not uh, president should be, for example, the 
one of our church servants. Uh, great. Right. Life. Guys, issue is the following. In, in the mo- point when the opening would be there, nation would start to search. And that search would create uh, some possibilities. Now, we have, for example, something similar in June 2021. But let's look what we done. I've been member of the parliament in where we have six parliamentary faction, which means that six political parties have passed 5% threshold. Can you tell me how many political parties or political units passed the threshold in 2021? Only two. Two. Now, when we said that we have been in a search for new faces, guys, there was a 26 political party or units participating in elections in June. Out of 26, we selected or allowed to push the threshold only for two. Whom now I am uh, trying to say that there were so many new faces. Why I forget to go and vote for the new face? Why I just simply choose between two old faces? Now, see, like, whenever people now telling me when looking for someone new, I'm saying that there was a, just a year ago that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Why not to select five or make the, our vote in a way that, for example, there would be seven to eight political parties passing threshold of 5%. Then we would have a totally different landscape in the parliament. And definitely neither Kochana nor Nikol Pashinyan would be the prime minister because they need to come up with the, some consensus uh, on someone. Who, who developed that situation? Me by my vote? Based on what? That there was a political manipulation, uh, there was information manipulations, there was part, then I would say that if Nikol Pashinyan would go, again, we would be having this information, I won't say war, but information propaganda point. And depending who would be much uh, nicer, that would be the case. This is over the point that how I am as a person, how I am as a citizen, have my resilience ready for not to play the games of political and information manipulations, but do my judgment really on the way to have my values and understanding what I'm really building up. That's why on that regard, I think definitely uh, I don't believe that we would have ever returned to the back situations. But with this, uh, we need to perfectly understand that uh, whatever is really now we need from the national point of view is the new negotiator, whoever it would be, but the new negotiator who can really uh, get the time at least from six to seven months for us to do deal or correct our crisis with the local crises. And see, like our local crisis is, is really creating, uh, becoming bigger in the number. If after November 20, it has been like security, maybe health issues, some national pride or something else. Now, educational, social, economic, after war in Ukraine, even becoming uh, much more worse uh, with the all statements and positions, whatever is going on in the region from our enemy side, it's our psychological one. Uh, we kind of lost, like Aliyev is saying, Armenians lost their aim. If previously they've been saying that Karabakh is ours, we need to fight, now they don't have aim. Now they need to find a new aim. And I think it's really good. Their aim should be peace. And after that, he proposing to me, not to have army, not to uh, have uh, kids. Uh, you need to be eliminated in something like this. This is a peace understanding of Azerbaijan. Now, that's why I'm saying that, guys, we are in the point of national crisis is coming here, would we have a state witness? We need to fight now for this. This is the most important. I, okay, on that note, I would like to close, but I want to mention one other thing that happened this past week. On Tuesday, the parents and the relatives of the fallen soldiers in the war of 2020 were out on the streets of Yerevan protesting Pashinyan's statements in parliament in April. Pashinyan had said that Armenia could have averted the war 
as a result of which, and I'm quoting, as a result of which we could have had the same situation as we have today, but of course without the casualties. And of course everybody knows that we lost almost 5,000 people and um, there's no empathy in this government for the people. And if I would tell me, I would just simply add that this is another political manipulative statement because first of all, there will, there never been such proposition with to having these results. The propositions was always different on the table, even if he would accept and uh, not go with the military solutions. But this is a, a kind of another manipulation, trying the arguments that uh, remember on first day of September 27, 2020, I went to the parliament and said that I can even stop war now. Yes. And the whole parliament at that time say, no, no, no. Yeah. Believe me, one day he would bring this to the table that, guys, I propose to you, you say no, now responsibility on you, not on me. This is a person who is perfectly putting always responsibility for all issues on others and never him. I'll just close by saying, I mean, there, it's just a quote. There's an old Greek saying, if a Turk is talking about peace, then you better get ready for war. I think it's apt. I think, I think it's a real uh, good end of the discussion. <laughs> Okay. For the people to understand. Okay. Thank you, Tevan, for joining us today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That was our Week in Review show, and we hope it helped you catch up with some of the issues in and around Armenia from this past week. As always, we invite your feedback and your suggestions. You can find us on most social media and podcast platforms or our website, groom.org. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on YouTube like our pages, and follow us on social media. On behalf of everyone in this episode, we wish you a good week. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.